Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to all the dear uh, participants, especially our young students, uh, student participants, our very energetic research participants, researchers, our very respected faculty participants, our distinguished speakers, Honorable Principal, ma'am, and all faculty members of Brahmananda Keshav Chandra College. Welcome you to day one of the international webinar series, part two, on biodiversity conservation and sustainable development, issues, challenges, and outcomes. We are very happy that we could manage to organize the day one of part two with a large number of participants. We have had a very good response, and it is so heartwarming to see that a large number of young population are interested in making some change in biodiversity conservation. And after effect and after thought of the pandemic, so we really welcome one and all. And let's roll on for day one. We have very interesting talks coming up. So I would welcome each one of you to get settled down. Maybe I'll, we'll take a few minutes more. And as I get a nod from our host or our co-host, uh, I would like to begin with the session. Do we have uh, both our speakers with us? Uh, okay. Yes, Dr. Ghosh, uh, both have joined in. Uh, Professor Sharma is also there and uh, Sri Ranjan Chatterjee al have also joined in. That's wonderful. So we have both as well, right. I welcome uh, both of our distinguished speakers and especially ask our faculty members, uh, Dr. Shongita Gongobadhyay, to kindly give a welcome address to all our participants and our distinguished speakers. Dr. Gongobadhyay. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome all the participants and the esteemed speakers in the international webinar series on biodiversity conservation and sustainable development organized by the postgraduate department of botany, Ramhanandru Keshav Chandu College, Kolkata, India. Today, we all have assembled in this virtual platform to start the second part of this international webinar series we have recently successfully completed the first part of this series and we are overwhelmed by the large number of participation. Biodiversity conservation and sustainable development essentially depends on people's participation and effective regulations. This has led us to discuss the role of government and academic institutions in biodiversity conservation today. We are delighted to have Mr. Ranjan Chatterjee with us today. He was former advisor to National Green Tribunal, India. We also have with us Professor Shanti Swaroop Sharma, head of Botany Department, School of Life Sciences, Sikkim University, Gangtok, India. Listening to both of them is a perfect blend of information from both the spheres, government and academics. I heartily welcome them on behalf of the organizing team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gongupadha. You have ab absolutely given us in a nutshell uh, our purpose for the webinar series. And uh, with that, I would like to start the inaugural session. We invite our respected principal, Madam, Professor Papia Chakravarti, who is the force behind this webinar series, to kindly deliver her inaugural address. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. I welcome our eminent speakers and the participants on behalf of Ramhananda Keshav Chandra College. Today, we have a very essential uh, topic uh, on role of government in conservation of biodiversity. This is a really a very crucial role and also it involves, if it involves all of us, the people, the commoners, 
then only we can survive in this situation, especially in the new normal time. Now, as we all know, that we have uh, the government regulating authority that is the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, MOEF, which has many regulatory forces under it. It has, uh, uh, there is an act, the Environment Protection Act of 1986, which was later amended in 1991 with the mandate of preventing environmental pollution in all its forms and to tackle specific environmental problems that are peculiar to different parts of the country. Now, the powers of this are coastal regulation zone, eco-sensitive zone, environment clearance, environmental labs, environmental standards, hazardous substance management, loss of ecology, noise pollution, ozone layer depletion, water pollution. Now, here, the eco-sensitive zones these are all the biosphere reserves, the coastal regulation zones, the marine reserves, the marine environment, the regulation regarding that. And then we had the Forest Conservation Act of 1980, which was later modified to schedule tribes and other traditional forest dwellers recognition of Forest Rights Act in 2006, which really dealt with the tribal people who survive on the traditional knowledge in the forest, the, all the forest products, which we really want to know. And then came the Wildlife Conservation WPA Act in 1972. And later on, the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau was set up where the wildlife protection was enforced. And as we all know, the forestry sector is facing many challenges like forest fires, illegal fall, felling of trees, illegal grazing, then encroachments on forest land, degradation of forest ecosystem, etc. So to maintain all these, a compensatory afforestation fund management and planning authority, CAMPA, has been constituted to promote afforestation and regeneration activities. And we have the National Green Tribunal Act 2010, which we will uh, come to know the, the subjects related, the act related uh, things we'll come to know from our eminent speaker, uh, Mr. Ranjan Chatterjee, which will uh, he'll explain us and we welcome you, sir. We'll hear from you regarding this and Another, the most effective implementation of the government is the National Biodiversity Authority. The Biodiversity Act 2002 and the rules were passed in 2004, where they have the BMCs in states. That is the Biodiversity Management Committee in all states. So these, the state biodiversity boards they have the biodiversity management committees in the local municipal areas also, and district-wise also. Now, these authorities, they deal with several aspects of the local issues, local challenges, local, the sustainable development of the local biodiversity. And we, they deal with the PBR, that is the People's Biodiversity Register, which is eco-restoration of the local biodiversity, conservation and sustainable utilization of the biological resources available locally and protection of traditional knowledge is being recorded in the PBR. So I also think we should learn about, we should know more about the our Indian biodiversity hotspots. And today we have with us another speaker, very eminent, uh, who will deal with us the medicinal plants aspect in the Himalayan region. So I welcome you all and I welcome the participants to hear from our eminent speakers and I thank the organizers for organizing such a nice webinar. Thank you all. Thank you so much ma'am for that wonderful inaugural speech uh, giving us a platform to begin uh, uh, today's deliberation. Before we go to the technical session, I would uh, request our co-host kindly give a glimpse of 
the activities that the Department of Botany, the UG and PG Department of Botany, Ramananda Keshav Chandra College at Kolkata, is carrying out over the years uh, in the field of biodiversity conservation, motivating our young minds. So let's take a glimpse of what we have been doing. Ghost, kindly play the slideshow. Yeah. This is a two-day uh, plantation drive. Uh, this is a two-day plantation drive uh, uh, titled Green Canvas. What is more uh, significant about it is that it was in collaboration with the NGO Udyog, where we have our alumni from the Department of Botany, and she had taken the initiative to get back to us and start a collaboration with the Department of Botany in the fields of biodiversity conservation. Next. This is a foray into the uh, fungal diversity in our college campus. We are very, very lucky to have a very green campus uh, full of biodiversity, which we have been recording for many years through our green audit project with the students. Next. This is a PBR study, People's Biodiversity Register, which our students have been carrying out for many years, uh, especially an initiative of the Eco Club of the Botany Department. They have been assessed uh, internally on their work. They look at the flora, fauna, and even the human dimension of the biodiversity uh, around the Bonhugli Lake uh, near the institution. Next. This is an eco club initiative of Botany Department where uh, a wetland corridor of the college has been uh, conserved as biodiversity site under the able guidance of our uh, principal ma'am, Professor Papia Chakraborty. And we were very proud, as I said the other day, that we have named it after Madam Janaki Ammal, uh, who was the first lady to get a PhD in botany. And she was also the uh, director of BSI uh, during the times of Jawaharlal Nehru. Next. These are field excursions. Uh, we carry out field ex long distance field excursions to other phytogeographical areas with our students, which are very exciting, very uh, challenging but huge learning experiences and uh, our students take them down memory lane. Uh, this is a celebration of Sir Jagadish Chandra Bose's uh, birth anniversary. Uh, we do it every year and we have a student's uh, presentation of posters and other works that they do in the field of science. Here, one of our faculty is uh, teaching our UG students how to collect soil samples for microbiological studies. Uh, we feel in future they will be utilizing these techniques. We were very proud to uh, organize an extension lecture with Professor Gaur Gopal Maiti of Kalyani University, one of the know-hows of uh, taxonomy in India, who gave us a hands-on training on angiosperm taxonomy in 2020. This is a very recent achievement on our part where we had a mushroom cultivation which was successfully initiated by one of our fac faculties and uh, the students were very excited about it and we intend to go further in this area. Next. This is also very uh, memorable for us where our UG students guided by our faculty who had participated in the National Science Day at uh, East Calcutta Girls College on the topic role of women in water management and conservation. And they had done very well in the presentation. The IQSC, uh, that is the internal quality assurance cell of our college and all the science departments of our college together had organized the National Science Day in 2020 and our every science department, the UG and PG students had presented different branches of their uh, work to the school students. And it was a very exciting and learning moment. Next. 
Thanks. This is another um, presentation by our senior students, our fourth semester PG students, who presented a poster in a national seminar uh, organized by Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandir, Belu. And uh, the title of the seminar was How to Checkmate Cancer, the Emperor of Melodies. And our students did a very good work in presenting the proteomic biomarkers of cancer and preventive strategies with phytomolecules and a silico approach guided by our faculty, of course. Next. Post. Next slide, please. These are our final year students. So that's it. Uh, I think we'll conclude here and we'll start with our technical sessions. I invite our senior faculty member, uh, Dr. Dinesh Halda. Sir, uh, are you online? Kindly switch on your video. Dr. Dinesh Halda. So I invite you to uh, give an introduction to our first speaker, Sri Ranjan Chatterjee, who is uh, going to uh, give a lecture in the technical session one. Would you kindly introduce uh, Sri Ranjan Chatterjee to all our audience? Namaskar, sir. Welcome. Unmute. Dinesh, uh, unmute. Ranjan, sir, could you unmute yourself? Dinesh, unmute yourself. Dinesh, and, uh, Dr. Dinesh Haldar, could you unmute yourself, please? Dr. Dinesh Haldar, could you unmute yourself? Yes, sir. Yes, yes that's yes. good. We can hear you, sir. No, again, you have muted. Unmute yourself, sir. Dr. Dinesh Haldar, uh, Mr. Ranjan Chatterjee, I request both of you to kindly unmute yourself. Just okay. going Thank you. on the Thank you, audio. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, just a minute, uh, Dr. Haldar. Uh, okay. Our first speaker, uh, Mr. Ranjan Chatterjee, would you just click on the button? Uh, host, please enable his uh, audio. Host, kindly enable the audio of our first speaker. Co-host? Yes, sir, that's done. That's done? Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you so much. Yes, please, uh, Dr. Dinesh Haldar, kindly introduce our first speaker, Sri Ranjan Chatterjee. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ghosh. I have the pleasure and honor to introduce our first keynote speaker, Sri Ranjan Chatterjee, retired IS officer and former member of National Green Tribunal, New Delhi, India. Today, Sri Chatterjee will speak on National Green Tribunal, the mass Sri Chatterjee has joined the Indian Administrative Service in 1976. He served as Joint Secretary, Civil Aviation, Government of India, and Chairman and Managing Director, Pawan Hans Helicopter Limited, in 1995 to 1996, where he played a significant role in restructuring and brand post positioning of organizations. He also served the position of Chairman, Airport Authority of India, 1996 to 1998, as a Principal Secretary, Education and Forest Department, Government of Meghalaya, 2001 to 2004. Joint Secretary, Ministry of Defense, Government of India and Department of Defense Production, till March 2007. As Chief Secretary, Government of Meghalaya, till 2009, where he was Instructor, uh, instrumental in setting up three key institutions in the state, Indian Institute of Management, Indian Institute of Fashion Technology, and the Public Health Foundation of India as a part of product comprehensive development mandate. He also served as consultant, planning commission, government of India, looking after the environment forest 
environment and climate change issue after his retirement he was appointed to the national green tribunal as an expert member on 2nd january 2013 where he shared benches with former supreme court and high court judges to decide environmental and forest issues focused on air water and industrial pollution topic including attending circuit benches of ngt across the country of local hearings apart from the administrative responsibilities and management sri chatterjee has also been very passionate about teaching currently he is a visiting professor at national law school university nlsu bangalore and he has been periodically delivering lectures at lbs national academy of administration missouri nls guwahati he also been addressing seminar on environment and forest related subject at iit delhi guwahati jaipur and shillong so with a short introduction i welcome sri chatterjee once again to this webinar thank you dr halda thank you dr halda that was such an illustrious a uh, background of uh, shri ranjan chatterji sir i think you have a lifelong experience in such varied areas that it really makes uh, it so interesting to hear from you so i open the floor to you uh, sir so you can interact with the students and uh, with the participants or you can start with your lecture first as you would like to go sir the floor is open to you uh, thank you dr ghosh um, i feel very humbled as i address the students post graduate students the faculty and many other participants across the country uh, organized by the brahmanand keshav chandra college kolkata and i think uh, professor gangopadhyay who initiated the entire thing today has set the bar rather high wherein she uh, mentioned about uh, the role of the responsibility of the government and uh, the coastal zone regulations the biosphere reserves so it covers a very wide spectrum so i would like to speak on a very limited issue with respect to the national green tribunal i shall introduce the subject briefly for about 10 to 12 minutes and the rest of the time i shall spend on certain important cases that i have had the good fortune of um, um of uh, being part of as the as part of the bench of the national green tribunal and one particular case as part of uh, the when i was chief secretary of meghalaya am i audible please am i audible yes sir you are absolutely audible yes sir okay yes. okay right so the if you to set the ball rolling kindly recall that in 2015 uh, on the 26th of january 2015 the republic day president obama of the united states who is uh, considered to be a very eminent president even if you count with uh, many of his uh, predecessors and the present uh, incumbent to that post also who's uh, who's held with a very high regard across the international world when he visited india uh, those days you know it was also felt that uh, delhi is a very polluted place and uh, at there was a screaming headline one of those days that delhi is perhaps the world's most polluted capital in the whole world and one day's uh, breathing of the air in and around delhi and uh, uh, actually amounts to an equivalent of smoking 40 cigarettes a day now you can imagine if you have a friend who is smoking 40 cigarettes a day uh what would you tell him you'll ask him to leave it immediately because it is considered extremely dangerous 
but can you leave delhi at that point of time how many people will have the option of leaving delhi and the suburbs of delhi in gurgaon noida and all these places which are highly polluted so this brings us to the main issue of environmental pollution now what is the environment environment is everything around us you know at home we have the environment at home with your spouse and children there is an office environment there is a environment outside so albert einstein had uh, defined environment in perhaps the most succinct terms when he said environment is everything except myself you know you leave yourself and the whole world is environment it depends you know which kind of environment you are talking of we are talking basically of the lithosphere which is the outer crust of the earth the hydrosphere that is all oceans lakes rivers the liquid vapor or ice and the atmosphere which is the gases around the earth so if you take that into account the question is is environment at peril now <clears throat> the uh, uh, biodiversity experts would agree with me when they say where if i say that you know if you take care of the environment the environment takes care of you but the real question is are you taking care of the environment are you concerned about the environment to take care of it so it is largely when you address these questions you come to the national green tribunal now what is it it is a specialized statutory body to adjudicate on environmental disputes it's a specialized body it adjudicates on environmental disputes the word dispute is very important there has to be a dispute somebody two people have to protest one person has to be an environmental damager and somebody else has to come in and say that look i object to this for such and such reasons and you have to go through law in the whole process so it was set up on the 18th of october 2010 by an act of parliament it had two earlier predecessors which were which were very short lived and which had a lot of lacune and so the national green tribunal which was set up has stood the test of time and today we are 10 years old with that institution now what is you know it was it was it is what is the inspiration behind it the main inspiration behind the national green tribunal is the constitution of india article 21 which says which includes right to a healthy environment right to life includes article 21 deals with right to life and right to life includes right to a healthy environment now it is also in consonance with the sustainable development goals and what does it do it it mandates enforcement of a legal right giving relief of compensation to persons or property who have suffered injury the word injury is very important it not only needs to be defined but it also needs to be quantified now you know all of you who have children at home or grandchildren or as the case may be when the child gets even the minutest of you know cut or a blister or anything you say the child has suffered injury and you disproportionately come to the rescue of the child saying that oh my god how will you do how will you cope with it i'll do this i'll do that even if it doesn't actually you know much more than the medicine it is your attitude which makes a little difference you know whereas over a period of time you know many of you are ladies who are having to manage both your workplace as well as your home you suffer a major blister you know you wouldn't be able to say it in the manner of a child that oh i have suffered so much and things like that you will you know mostly take it that oh it has happened 
maybe after a few days it will become all right so it's a question of quantifying the injury it's a scientific term and how much injury has been caused both to your property or to yourself the law lays down you know there is the law of torts uh, of giving compensation now i will relay narrate a very interesting small case with regard to the law of torts and the compensation i think around the turn of the century that means when we were still in the previous century i mean um, two centuries ago rather 1900 around that time there in a factory work a lady had lost her thumb she had lost her thumb and so she claimed that she wanted to get about 400 4000 pounds for the loss of that thumb so the judge asked her a simple question that madam i know that you have suffered the loss of a thumb but don't you think 4000 pounds is a bit too much on the higher side so her reply is very classic she says not if you consider that that was the thumb by which i could control my husband so you know so it is all you know on in, in a real terms loss of anything of a part of your body whether it is your thumb or your hand or your arm or you lose your life these are all quantified things and we are all in the process of evolving it and fine tuning it both in law as well as gradually through the case laws now <clears throat> india incidentally is the world's third country after australia and new zealand to have specialized environmental courts you know in, and why is ngt a specialized environmental courts you already have the high courts in the supreme court no the law commission of india felt that it is necessary to have specialized environmental courts where not only judges would be there but also experts in the field of environment who have at least 15 years of experience in the field of environment and or who have been environmental administrators for at least five years. So it is the role of the expert members of the Green Tribunal, which gives the speciality or which gives the special arm to the National Green Tribunal as a specialized body because they felt that judges by themselves may be excellent as judges, but they may not have the knowledge of environment to that extent. So they required that specialized people should be there. And I would also like to bring to your notice that, um, you know, the law in India leading to the National Green Tribunal being created dates back to 1972 that of the Stockholm Declaration of United Nations, uh, when Mrs. Gandhi had also, our prime minister had also, uh, you know, visited and she gave that famous line speech over there where she said poverty is the biggest pollutant. Poverty itself is a very big pollutant. And then we went to the uh, Rio, Rio de Janeiro conference in 1992 and uh, so in the midst of all this, there was a lot of international pressure. So our laws came into being. Now, which are these important laws? Uh, Dr. Mrs. Gangopadhyay I mentioned some of them. They are the seven acts of parliament, which the National Green Tribunal adjudicates on. These are the Water Prevention of Pollution Act, 1974, the Water Cess Act, 1977, the Forest Conservation Act, 1980, the Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act, 1981. In fact, the Water Act and the Air Act are both very important. Uh, Environmental Protection Act, 1986, which is again very important the Public Liability Act of 1991, 
and the Biological Diversity Act of 2002. So NGT has been given the mandate to look after disputes relating to these seven acts. The Wildlife Act, for instance, is not covered by the NGT. And another interesting feature of the National Green Tribunal is that it is governed by three principles. Unlike the regular courts, and what are those principles? One is the principle of natural justice, not so much by law, but by the principles of natural justice. In the important sense that the civil procedure court does not apply to the NGT, it can violate or go beyond the civil procedure court. Whereas ordinary high courts and honorable high courts and honorable Supreme Court have to comply with the civil procedure court. NGT need not as per the act. The second one is the polluter pays principle. Now this is again very important. Whosoever pollutes must pay for it. Like if you have done something wrong, you have to pay for it. And so for that, there will have to be a dispute and the NGT will have to give a ruling and nobody should go to the Supreme Court. You know, um, and if they have gone to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court must uphold what the NGT has done. So, and the third one is the precautionary principle. That means that you don't have to wait for an accident to actually take place. If you are able to prove that, look, somebody has damaged it to such an extent, that means if I am a farmer and I have a field, next to me, somebody has the person who has, who has the next farm. If he has sold it off to somebody who is making a brick kin, are you, are you aware of this? Are you with me? Are you getting me, friends? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are very yeah. much. So next to me, if in uh, uh, Dr. Ghosh's, uh, Dr. Ghosh sells off, supposing her field, to, to some brick kin, and that brick kin, you know, digs up the whole place with a view to taking the earth and using it for making bricks, then that is a big damage to me. Because what will happen is when the rain comes, all my topsoil will go into that. And so I can protest against it and say that, look, there needs to be a buffer. There needs to be something to protect my field. So you don't have to actually wait till my land caves in, but I can go and appeal to the NGT again by a suitable um, clause. And the NGT can take a decision under the principle of precautionary principle. So in, as a precautionary measure, prevention is better than cure. That is the idea. Now, having said that, uh, you know, NGT government or the parliament, you know, framed the NGT and the laws with great expectations. And they said that appeals against the orders of the NGT cannot be tried by the High Court. It can be tried only by the Supreme Court. So if anybody has an objection, then that person will have to go to the Supreme Court, not to any High Court. Now, however, before I conclude, I would like to give a few criticisms which, have, uh, which are leveled against the NGT um, over the last 10 years. First is, it is felt that NGT has overstepped its boundaries, you know. It has led to certain overreach, judicial overreach of the NGT. Now, they have gone beyond their mandate. One such illustration is taking up cases suo moto. You know, they said that NGT does not have the power to take up cases suo moto. In fact, NGT had entertained a few things suo moto and had taken it up without a dispute, whether anybody pointing out a dispute, but NGT had taken it up. So the High Court of Madras came in and stayed that. They said that no. NGT cannot do that, you know. So then another thing they have, people have complained is that NGT, there are a lot of pendencies. You know, you have not, the whole idea of NGT was to render speedy justice in environmental cases, but this has not happened. 
um, there, but the truth is that, you know, NGT in the last 10 years has disposed of about 30,000 cases, 29,800 something. And about 3,000 cases are still pending. So that's not a big number. I don't think it is a valid criticism. The most important difficulty with the NGT is government is not well disposed towards the NGT. Government feels that NGT is coming in the way of uh, their developmental projects. Government wants to do so many things. They want quick environmental clearances. Whereas you actually find that people have come and protested against big dams coming up in Arunachal Pradesh, against so many projects in Gujarat um, and all over the country where you know, the project proponents or the industrialists have tried to sidestep environmental clearances and have tried to get the clearances, quote unquote, through hook and by crook. You know, I would not like to go further on this particular subject, but the government today feels that uh, this, is, this is not okay. So that is why they are amending the EIA. There is a lot of debate going on currently about the environmental impact assessment. Now, this is a very, very important subject. For major projects, environmental impact assessment is supposed to be done for two or three seasons at the same time. But people are in a hurry. So that is why they don't want in these things to come up before the NGT. Environment impact assessment is a major science which has been de developed globally. And I think we should respect it. We are not against development. NGT is not against development, but it should be sustainable development. The uh, the another major criticism is that the money which the NGT imposes as fine very often remains with the Central Pollution Control Board or the State Poll Pollution Control Committee and without actually causing the remediation. Now, if you give me money and I keep it safely, but I don't spend the money for the environmental upgradation or remediation, then it is useless. So they feel that uh, this is uh, not in order. And I think this is a very valid criticism, you know, because the law lays down that it, there is something called an environment relief fund, which should be operated by the United India Insurance Company. But instead, even the NGT or anybody gives a lot of money to the CPCB or to the uh, State Pollution Control Board or to certain wings of the government. But that part of it is good. The only thing is that it should be well spent for an environmental cause, which is not happening very often. And the last thing is that often the damage which is caused to the environment has still not become very refined. It has not become very refined. So the assessment of damage, it is criticized. This is a criticism is often done by guesswork. You know, it is not actually scientifically, you cannot say that this is the damage because when you scientifically do it, you find that the damage is less or damage is more. So how did you arrive at a judgment by saying that this is the extent of the damage and this is the monetary value of it? You know, that part of it is sometimes by guesswork. This is what they say. Now, <clears throat> I think I shall close the thing with respect to the NGT on this. But I think uh, our students and teachers would be able to relate much more to some of the important cases, you know, about which you have heard or you have read, or read about. And you know, what are the issues pertaining to it? The first one is if uh, most people that, you know, in drawing room sessions, whenever people have heard that I am a part of NGT, they ask me whether the, uh, you know, art of living Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, whether they paid the five crores or not. You know, I told them that this is not a very major case. It is uh, basically relating to uh, the use of the Yamuna floodplains, you know, on the banks of the Yamuna. A uh, couple of years back, I think 2015, 
he wanted to use the yamuna flood plains and um, he set up he set it up you know without taking environmental clearance and um, you know did a lot of compaction you know with the help of very heavy equipments so what happened is that um, a lot of things which are part of the diversity you know got killed in the process uh, those of you uh, you know who like to eat good fish would have uh, heard of the fish called uh, lotte 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 fish you know which in english is called eel you know it doesn't grow it doesn't come from the water it doesn't come from the land but it comes from the flood plains and it is one of the most tastiest fishes but in common english parlance they say as slippery as an eel you know as slippery as an eel but uh, like that there are earthworms there are so many things you see and once the flood plains are compacted there is a lot of damage because those flood plains actually are very alluvial soil you know it grows excellent vegetables over there without any kind of manure and so on so we in the ngt had imposed a fine of rupees 5 crores which was uh, protested by the members or the advocates representing the art of living but i remember the protest notwithstanding ngt put its foot down government also you know um, well has was perhaps on the different side i recall the very important person from the government who attended that particular conference though the honorable president you know he excused himself he recused himself uh, uh, the president pranab mukherjee he did not attend this just at the nick of time so this is one the second major case i think on which the ngt spent a lot of time is the one on ganga cleaning you know ganga is our lifeline in the whole of north india and right after it uh, emerges from deoprayag where the ganga and the bhagirathi meet and thereafter it comes to hardwar you know those of you who have been to hardwar uh, you know would uh, perhaps recall that lord dalousi had a lot to do with the development of hardwar you know even though they were they were a foreign power and they were not interested in our religion but the building up that entire that is actually a canal of ganga that is not the original flow of the ganga river so that was drying up and this place was utilized so harki podi and all these places have been beautifully developed but after that only you see that the water becomes gradually very dirty so the ngt uh, was trying you know the world bank has given money asian development has given money ganga has been an important subject for a long time with the government but unfortunately as uh, the former uh, the uh, chairperson of the national green tribunal justice swatantra kumar you know who was a very fiery kind of a person had stated that what have you done he says in his one of his orders he said not a drop not a drop has been cleaned ganga has only become dirtier by the years now there is a lot of truth in what he had said so even though the honorable prime minister has started the namami gange project the present honorable prime minister has started the namami gange project but unfortunately you know you find that there is so much of pollutants coming from amroha and bijnor industrial units which are using the ganga water and also pushing back all the pollutants into the ganga which they are not supposed to do and the kanpur tanneries you know kanpur you know is a big uh, center for leather and all these are a large number of tanneries which use the uh, which use the um, ganga water and uh, the and they discharge all their pollutants into the ganga river so uh, a lot of effort has been made now 
to remove these people from the banks of the Ganga and to push them inside, uh, where there are proper plants to look after their uh, the sewage and the effluents coming out of the tanneries. But these people are reluctant to go. So NGT started a very interesting concept of called participative adjudication. Now, which is something very interesting. I was a party to all that. So what we used to do is that we used to have conferences and meetings where we used to call the chief secretaries and important functionaries and others who would come and then discuss this whole matter. And we would have the stenographers ready. So once where they say that, look, this is the extent of pollution and this is what we can do. It says, fine, that let it be recorded over here. But next day when the case comes up in the court, the advocate should not say that this was never stated. So that way we made recorded some progress in the cleaning of the Ganga. So Ganga has been was divided into three parts. Right from Deoprayag onwards to the end of Uttar Pradesh, then from Uttar Pradesh on to a portion to the whole of Bihar and a little portion of Jharkhand, and the third one into the West Bengal, falling into the Bay of Bengal. So, <clears throat> one by one, these things have been uh, addressed, and uh, a lot of work has been done. In fact, you know, the interesting thing is the authorities were quite clueless about how many drains are carrying pollutants into the Ganga. The question is not of cleaning the Ganga, but you have to clean the drains first. If you clean the source, then the effluents would not fall into the Ganga and make it dirty. Uh, so with Mr. Goel, uh, Justice Goel, the present uh, chairperson, a new process has started. It is called the in-situ remediation. In-situ remediation. So that you, in the process of flowing, you have to use a lot of agents whereby you can start cleaning the Ganga. Otherwise, <clears throat> those of you who are aware of this particular subject, there is so much of contamination going on in the groundwater also. Our groundwater is very contaminated. So if I contaminate the groundwater and you are living close by, you are drinking water from a tube well. So the contaminated water is something which you are drinking, which is extremely dangerous. We found this in the case of pharma companies, pharmaceutical companies in Punjab. We found this in the case of Coca-Cola where what they did is they took a deep pipe and at a great distance it was falling. The whole ground was covered. So nobody came to know that it was actually coming out of Coca-Cola plant. But when it was actually discovered and we were able to you know, find out the details, then the question was of how to fix the compensation and which we did. Then, you know, I have myself seen, you must have heard of this Panipat in Haryana, you know, the battles of Panipat are very famous, which uh, steered the history of India. Now at Panipat, there are a large number of uh, uh, plants, you know, which are uh, for dyes and chemicals. So what the government has done is they said they have set up STPs, sewage treatment plants, STPs. I found to my horror that the STPs are just not used. They are simply showpieces, something like kept in a drawing room because they don't want to use the um, electricity for the STPs. So they simply push all their effluents and all the waste into the ground, having very little regard to the contamination that is taking place. So this according to me, is a very important case and I think you should keep following it. I mean, I would request all the students to follow it. Another important case, are, are you finding it interesting, please? Are you finding it interesting or I should stop? Absolutely, it's very relevant, but if we can take some interaction also, if you would like to. 
yeah i would take kindly note it down we'll take interactions in the end otherwise i lose my flow absolutely yeah so <clears throat> and the next one is with regard to samir mehta's case um, that is a very interesting case uh, this it relates to 2011 where a ship named mv rack r a k it was a ship carrying coal from indonesia to the port of dahej in gujarat and um, it was owned by adani and uh, the industrialist and um, so <clears throat> 20 nautical miles away from the coast of bombay the ship wrecked and fell down so letting loose about 60000 metric tons of coal and 290 tons of fuel all into the water so as a result there was a huge oil spillage and it spoiled the oil in a very large area so the fishermen of the coast of bombay who were going you know and lot of birds were dying lot of fish died fishermen you know they lost their livelihood so it was a big nuisance so nobody was doing anything so the coast guards the governmental authority were asked to do something and they spent a lot of money in trying to clear to some extent but not fully now when this case came up before the ngt i think it was one of the most interesting cases you know you can it it is worthy of being made into a movie according to me you know they engaged the best of lawyers and uh, the insurance companies and um, uh, underwriters and everybody they were all there you know the best of them the most well paid people had come to argue and then it was found that this was uh, a come i mean this was a um, thing uh, uh, registered in panama and dubai and we also found that um, you know everybody had gone bankrupt there was nobody to pay the compensation so we must have taken at least 100 hearings of this particular case and then at the end of it and this the ship was also uns unseaworthy ship was unseaworthy so therefore how they gave the clearance for the ship to travel because any moment it could have collapsed you know so and if it collapsed it has collapsed so therefore the human mischief or the human cleverness you know was passed on to an en great environmental damage so the ngt uh, you know find them uh, 100 uh, 100 crores 100 crores and so nobody has gone on appeal against it but perhaps after that i left the ngt in 2017 perhaps nobody has paid up that money also so far so that is one case the um, another case you see i want to uh, bring to your notice a major case is uh, relating to the period when i was in meghalaya so those of you who are from the northeast might find it interesting it is called the lafarge case you know there's so a lafarge is a huge uh cement manufacturer based in france and they have branches uh, it's a multinational so you know before the partition of india the limestones are found in meghalaya in the hills but the cement companies were the, the cement manufacturing companies were in the area falling in bangladesh so those of you uh, who have been to cherapunji i am sure many of you must have been to cherapunji also called sohra if you stand there on a clear day you will notice smoke billowing out at the bottom now that is from a factory in chatak in falling in bangladesh so with the partition of india there they found that you know uh, even though new cement companies started coming in india lafarge wanted to do take the limestone of meghalaya and do the cement manufacturing in bangladesh through an international agreement while uh, at some point of time 
it was uh, 2006, 2007, it was allowed. Eventually, um, it was taken to the Supreme Court because um, it was felt that it was violative of the National Forest Policy of 1988. Uh, Madam Ganguly had referred to the National Forest Policy. So this was violative of the National Forest Policy of 1988. And a very important person, Harish Salve, uh, was made the amicus curie. So Harish Salve argued that, look, Meghalaya cannot barter away the raw material of India and make Bangladesh, you know, get the finished products. Because they say that, you know, you should sell finished products. You cannot sell raw materials and thereby your, your people are the losers. So initially they stopped it. But I was in the Meghalaya government at that point of time. But we fought our way through. And we said that Meghalaya people have a right of self-determination. It is the people of Meghalaya who would like to decide what is good for them. And since it is part of the tribal ethos of the people, it was felt that if they have done this agreement, they have done the agreement. So if, if you find something wrong with it, Tell us what is wrong with it. But otherwise, merely sending it, selling it to Bangladesh, you know, is there is nothing wrong. We can take more profits out of it. That is a different thing. Eventually, the Supreme Court, you know, ban was lifted and the government allowed it. So Lafarge is a very important case. Now, in the NGT also, there are certain pending cases of Lafarge because a new mine was taken. And the environmental clearance of it has been questioned. So there is a case uh, in the uh, NGT and there is a case pending in the Supreme Court. It is yet to be finally decided. But I have shared with you what I know. Now, <clears throat> the um, another important case where I was very much a part of and had to write the judgment was relating to Odisha. This we used to call the Mathala case. There was a gentleman called Mr. Mathala who was 78 years old and he used to come to the court regularly and say that as part of the golden quadrilateral, the road from Calcutta to Chennai passing through Odisha had to be widened. So government was putting pressure in, you know, and this person who was the contractor, he started the whole work of expansion but he did not, he set up a stone crusher without taking any precautionary measures as per the law. The law says if you set up a stone crusher, there is a lot of stone dust. So you have to take care of the stone dust because if you, if you breathe stone dust, you know, you are actually breathing the stones inside, you know. It is very dangerous to your pulmonary system. So, uh, and meanwhile, you know, while the case was going on, at that stage, the work was completed and the contractor was wanted to walk away. And the, uh, we said nothing doing. We looked at it and it is a very interesting case. We found what was Mathala's complaint. Mathala's complaint was agriculture has been badly disrupted. I could not grow my crops during those two, three seasons. And thirdly, he says health of the people was badly disrupted people suffered adverse health conditions. So when we asked the agriculture department, you know, to give us the records, the agriculture department cooked up certain things and possibly they were managed. So we could not catch them on that. But on grounds on the health side, we found that we were quite right. The respiratory people suffering from chest problems, the respiratory side of it, we had increased in number during the particular period when we had uh, the stone crushing going on. So what we did at the end of it is we said uh, we um, find them five lakhs, the project proponents, we find them five lakhs with a, and we gave it to the collector of that particular district to have five additional rooms in the local hospital and we requested the government of Odisha to send in pulmonary experts, 
chest experts more regularly and we also compensated mathala for the 74 trips he had made 74 trips to delhi you know going and coming put together you divide it by two so there were total 74 journeys so we calculated that by uh, ac 3 tier coming from bhubaneswar how much does it cost and we gave it to him so i thought it was a good judgment but after some time he came back and told the ngt that uh, i want a review petition so what is the review he said that this is hardly anything you should pay me much more so which the court did not entertain but uh, i thought it was a very landmark case because even the small man was recognized he did not have an advocate he was fighting on his own now if we come to close at home west bengal i will conclude in about 5 minutes or so the in in shantini ketan you know you have the posh mela every year and many of you may have visited and have enjoyed it also but uh, in the recent past you know the uh, ngt had stated that you have to set up a solid waste uh, and a sewage treatment plant over there uh, so this is the direction so so these people the uh, either the poro sabha or the uh, the bazaar committee did not have enough money to do it so they said ki we will not have the posh mela now what is the history of posh mela you know it was started during rabindranath tagore nobel laureate's time and to sell village handicrafts you know from sriniketan and so shops were allowed to be opened so for about 110 years you know this was held for about 4 days only but in the recent past for the last 10 years or so the businessmen have become so greedy so acquisitive that beyond the 4 days they want to extend it by another 10 to 12 days and they were using diesel generator sets and instead of sending selling only um, village handicrafts from sriniketan and other things now they are uh, selling things like tractors water purifiers and everything under the sun so you know people complain and eventually ngt after listening to them and going into all aspects of it have said that no you can't do it this is not the way until and unless you set up you know solid waste and sewage treatment plants which they can't so that is why this year it has been struck uh, you know, uh, the other illustration is about the West Bengal firecrackers case. You know, during Kali Puja, Diwali, there's a lot of noise pollution. And for some, re for some time, West Bengal was in the forefront. They had controlled the um, firecrackers pollution significantly in the uh, till around 2009, 10 and things like that. Until then, it was all right, but the major manufacturers of firecrackers come from Shivakashi in Kerala. So they are manufacturing in such a manner so as to have economy of scale, where for the rest of the country, the, the uh, norm is that up to 125 decibels it is allowed. Whereas in West Bengal, they had said it should be brought down to 90 decibels. So the Firecrackers Association and uh, those people fought tooth and nail. And uh, the NGT said that, you know, you... Um, okay, they said, let the West Bengal Pollution Control Board, which had set it at 90 decibels, you uh, have a scientific study and find out, you know, what is the difference between 125 decibels in the rest of the country and 90 decibels only in West Bengal. And if you come with a reasonably good convincing argument, we will agree. Unfortunately, the government of West Bengal, through the West Bengal Pollution Control Board, reiterated the same thing. They did not have a proper scientific study. So as a result, you know, that case fell through 
and unfortunately it is still 125 decibels so as and when uh, the pollution control board of the state is able to do something proper perhaps you know the sound can be controlled then another illustration of sound control sound uh, management is you know there was a case of a punjabi dhaba in uh, noida these fellows you know used to have very loud music but within 100 yards there was a hospital so somebody complained and as you know the requirement is before in front of hospitals it has to be not exceeding 55 decibels during daytime and 40 decibels during night so when we pointed out this thing the dhaba people were uh, very belligerent they did not agree so we closed down the dhaba then after about a couple of months they came and said that we will control the sound we will do so once the pollution control board said that they have set up things properly then um, we reopened it and uh, so i think um, i have exceeded my time otherwise i had one or two interesting cases one was the rat hole mining in meghalaya that will come in our discussion in our okay so i'll leave it thank you very much ma'am so much for such a wonderful elaborative uh, view into the role of ngt i think it has been really challenging and uh, gratifying also when you have had some success in some cases can you hear me yes yes indeed yes sir so uh, it was wonderful and there are few interactions before that we would like to know what is the framework of ngt i mean how is ngt formed ngt has a chairperson who is a supreme court retired judge or the or a chief justice of a high court so far we have had retired judges from the supreme court only justice panta then justice swatantra kumar and justice goel okay. then it has judicial members who are all retired judges from the high court and it has expert members so who are either professors of um, of any of any environmental science either fisheries or things like that it could be engineers who deal with environmental pollution or i so far i have been the only ias officer because i had about 12 years of experience dealing with environment you know so but uh, anyway i mean i i i have i would rather be very humble because it was i sat with a galaxy of important people so therefore um, minimum requirement is 21 today uh, ngt has very few members but i believe the government is now finally coming forward you know there is a lot of pressure on the government to include more members so once that comes there are four benches of the uh, ngt apart from the principal bench there is one at uh, kolkata one at bhopal one at pune and one at chennai so this is how it is sir Thanks i so have much. a question uh, vishwarupa can i ask a question please, please go ahead uh -huh. sir i have a question that when does a case go to ngt Uh, does it first reach the benches and then goes to the ngt or it directly goes to ngt no ma'am the benches are a part of ngt okay. We, there is no separation between the calcutta bench and the uh, principal bench you can go to any bench or you can go to delhi basically you have to register a dispute you know supposing you are an industrialist ma'am or let us say bishwarupa dr ghosh is an industrialist she is causing some pollution and you are protesting you know then you that that becomes a dispute so you have to there is a format and 1000 uh, rupees has to be paid and as per that format you can online you can go or you can engage an advocate you can go yourself and file a petition before the ngt under a suitable section of law then it will come up before the ngt within a month or so or 15 days it could be immediate also if it is urgent it could come up the next day if it is urgent okay and thereafter it goes on thank you sir thank you for your question ma'am principal ma'am uh, one of our participants avinash has asked where is the environment court 
Uh, what are the procedures to know about it? One of our young participants. Well, Avinash, uh, I think it's, it's a very good question. Uh, these are the environmental courts. Now, today, National Green Tribunal are the environmental courts in India. Okay. And, but over and above that, the high courts also take up environmental cases. There is no ban on them. It is expected that they would hand over these cases to the NGT. But some high court judges feel that they should do it themselves. And the Supreme Court also deals with environmental cases. That is the apex body. And there have been some judges of the Supreme Court who have been extremely proactive about uh, environmental matters. So this is the entire you know, framework of environmental courts in India. The National Green Tribunal, some, some high courts if they take an interest, and the Supreme Court. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, you had already covered a part of it, but there is a question from uh, Dr. Shopun Mondal. He's asking how, what is the present status of the Ganga project? Ganga Clean, Clean Ganga Action Plan. What is the present status? Yeah, the, you know, it is, it is, there is a Namami Ganga project under the government. And it is also funded by international agencies because it is a very important project. It deals with the livelihoods of so many people. But until and unless the Ganga becomes clean, it will not remain Pavitra Ganga. It will only become Maili Ganga. So very difficult to say what exactly is the uh, progress. Allow me to put it like this, ma'am, that uh, when I was uh, 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 you know, with the planning commission as a consultant, Dr. Kasturi Rangan, with whom I used to work, the missile man, uh, he had asked a question and where it was found that, uh, where it was found that going by the present rate, how long would it take to clean the Ganga? And it was found that it would take as much as 83 years, you know, where I don't know whether your grandchildren would be alive also by that time. So that is a very sad spectacle. We have made our Ganga so dirty that it would take 83 years to clean. But it was, I am talking of the time 2010, 2011, when I was there. Since then, I believe progress has been made. And if we are able to, you know, that in situ remediation that is being practiced now. And uh, the... Uh, kind of uh, active interest which the NGT is taking. And if the state governments also are in sync, then perhaps, you know, a lot can be done. You know, Dr. Mrs. Gangopadhyay had said the role of the government. But unfortunately, I think, you know, I mean, I would like to respond by saying it is not merely the role of the government. Everybody, she also said, I think role of the people is very important. Role of the community is very important. If we all take care of this, you know, then it would it would uh, become much much better. Now, I will like to share with you a very grim illustration. I was told that you know, in the rural areas, what happens is when in the poor people's families, when anybody dies, you know, what happens is they don't have sufficient money also. So they take the dead bodies on a bicycle, you know, crossing it on the carrier, take it on the banks of the Ganga, put one log or something like that, because firewood is very expensive. And thereafter, you know, when it is half burned, they throw it into the Ganga. But all the efforts which are going on for setting up electric crematorium, this, that, etc., are in vain. You know, so a lot of, lot of, change of mindset has to be there on from the people's side and the community must support such causes only then can ganga be cleaned absolutely sir our principal ma'am professor papia chakravarti also had said the same thing and people's participation has to be the most important thing here we have a question from uh, dr ratul vaishya of uh, delhi university 
he has complimented you sir excellent talk on the environmental issues and role of ngt can you comment on the bagjan oil field explosion what went wrong and who is responsible the bagjan oil explosion in assam could you kindly comment on that well i mean i my observation thank you very much doctor so for your compliments and okay. um, i can i can i can only say with respect to bagjan what i have followed from the media and it is a very unfortunate thing it is somewhere uh, very close to uh, dibru saikwa national park in uh, dibrugar near tinsukia near tinsukia and uh, this this oil flaring has been there in assam at a couple of places for a long time and we have not been able to control it now this particular flaring has caused a lot of damage some human beings are lost you know one driver and somebody else from the fire side and they say the oil india duliajan people say that they had um, outsourced this particular thing to some singapore company and who have not been able to control it appropriately but now i think after a long time perhaps something has been done in the recent past last few days ago i was told that it has improved a little bit but uh, incidentally i inquired uh, from somebody in um, from a tea garden uh, they said that uh, dibru saikwa perhaps will not be so adversely affected this is my personal information which i collected but i think it's a very tragic thing that, that it has happened and i think we have to learn a lot of lessons from this uh, particular uh, flaring thank you sir one question from a, one of the students oindrila ganguly she is asking sir waste disposal problems are arising in my area due to encroachment of the disposal land how to draw attention of the authorities well i would think i think it's uh, you are on the right tracks uh, oindrila you know, uh, oindrila so but first and foremost you have to get in touch with your uh, local authorities it could be your uh, subdivisional officer or the bdo as the case may be or if you can go to anybody from the pollution control department you know and write a petition don't just speak write a petition and send a petition online to the west bengal pollution control board this is happening at a lot of places not only in your uh, neighborhood because the you know the place for garbage disposal is becoming smaller and smaller a the garbage is not lifted b there is an encroachment on that land so all over the country there is so much of encroachment that it has become unfortunate you know that um, in west bengal i think there are so many issues which are not being addressed i don't know i think this is a fit case where you can go to as i said the uh, pollution control board or the local bdo and if you think the bdo is not doing enough send it to the national green tribunal they will take cognizance of it thank you so much sir if even though we are a little behind schedule i'll take a question here from priyanka dhar dr priyanka dhar is there any future initiative to be taken by ngt during the lockdown experience of environmental rejuvenation i mean that's a very interesting aspect would ngt be looking at it well i think uh, <clears throat> with the lockdown from an environmental point of view things are better truthfully speaking we are able to at least in delhi we could never see the clear blue skies now we can see it you know there is la- less pollution less vehicles on the roads all over the country then jamuna has become much cleaner you know yamuna river has become much cleaner because you know industries are not working they are not dropping uh, surreptitiously effluents into the river so but they are trying to from an ngt's perspective they are doing online a lot of adjudication i think it is very difficult to do online adjudication you know it's not so easy but still they are trying a lot of cases if you read in the news newspapers ngt is going on fighting its own 
battles, you know, say for instance, the Shantini Ketan thing is very recent. And uh, so many cases are coming up all over the country. And uh, NGT is trying its best. But, you know, in a lockdown situation, which is the new normal, uh, this is only so much that you can do. You can't do more than this. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, the last question, and uh, briefly, we will just touch it. Uh, what about what was your experience about the rat hole mining and NGT's approach to it in Meghalaya when you were the chief secretary of Meghalaya? So briefly, well, could you tell us? Yeah, yeah. briefly, I was, uh, you know, uh, the case didn't come up when I was the chief secretary. Case came up much later when I was with the NGT. So, but I knew that this is a very bad practice. Uh, because it is an unscientific, my rat hole mining is an unscientific practice of mining where uh, they use children because big people cannot enter these small cavities. It is about maximum three to four uh, feet, you know, of the size. So the small children, you know, they enter that area and keep on extracting uh, the limestones from there. So, uh, sorry, extracting the coal from there. So, coal is a very important resource. You know, they say that Meghalaya itself has about 640 million tons of coal, you know, as reserves. So, unfortunately, the state has no policy. I was pushing very hard for a policy. So, in 2012, state came out with a policy on rat hole mining. At that time, I was with the Government of India and the Planning Commission. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the un unfortunate thing that there is a lack of political will. There is a lot of collusion between the miners, you know, and the political people. There are a lot of Benami mines, uh, you know, with, the, with these uh, people. And uh, so we had brought in the uh, Coal India Limited, who wanted to take it up. And we said that, you know, you experiment with it for a few years, five to 10 years, and they will have better health facilities for the miners, better scientific things and things like that. But uh, there was a lot of opposition to it. You know, nobody wanted to do it. So, you know, in 2014, NGT took up this case and um, uh, and um, very recently, you know, you must have read about the deaths which took place in Meghalaya in the Garo Hills, where as a result of the mine collapsing, because the coal sims are very thin, you know, and the water turns acidic, and the BOD levels are very high. So <clears throat> when it was stopped by the NGT, now, there was a lot of mischief going on in the sense they kept on saying that there is a lot of coal which is pre-mined, mined in advance. So they said, allow us to transport it. Now, NGT said that if you keep the coal over there and it, there is six months, you know, it rains in Meghalaya, more than six months. So they said that it would, it would lead to greater pollution. So they said, okay, we will allow you to transport the coal which is already mined but what they kept on doing is they would remove that coal and at night they would bring more coal mine more coal and keep it over there so that became this kind of a mischief continued for a couple of years it is a very difficult thing you know because Meghalaya is a poor state people are poor there is a lot of uh, <clears throat> exploitation of the labor and, uh, you know, and in the rat hole mining, <coughs> it, it is the children of Nepal and the children of Bangladesh who are there. There are, uh, you know, public interest groups which are at play, but, you know, government thinks differently. And uh, finally, Supreme Court, it went out of the hands of uh, the NGT. They approached the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has uh, said that, you know, you can take uh, the uh, pre-mined coal. Now, there was a, you know, NGT had appointed a committee under Justice Kakati 
of Guwahati High Court. Ultimately, Dr. Kakati also, uh, Justice Kakati also put his hands up. He has resigned in protest. In protest, I am adding within parenthesis, he has resigned. So this is the situation of the rat hole mining. Absolutely. Even unless there is a political will, you can't do anything in India. Absolutely, sir. Thank you so much for such great interaction. And I'm sure after Sir uh, Ranjan Chatterjee's talk, uh, social scientists, physical scientists, biological scientists, all of us can see the scope of the changes that we can make in biodiversity conservation. And the uh, uh, Mathala case that Sir talked about anyone and everyone can make a change in biodiversity conservation. You don't need a special degree to be a conservationist. So with that, uh, we thank you, sir, once more for being with us and sharing your lifelong experiences, giving us a new window through NGT to fight for environmental causes. With that, uh, I, will welcome, I will ask you to stay with us if possible, and we'll move on to the next technical session. Thank you. Thank so, you. Thank you so much, sir. We're moving on to the next technical session, uh, session two. Uh, and our speaker for today in the technical session two is uh, Professor Shanti Swarup Sharma from Sikkim University. I, will, I ask our faculty member, Dr. Shapun Mondal, to kindly introduce her uh, to our audience. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. It's a great pleasure for me to get a chance to introduce Dr. Shanti Shorup Sharma. Today, he will enlighten us on seed physiological aspects of some medicinal plants from Western Himalaya, implementation implication for cultivation and conservation also. Dr. Shanti Shorup Sharma is now the head and professor, Department of Botany, School of Life Sciences, Sikkim University, Sikkim. Dr. Sharma has obtained MSc, MPhil, and PhD, also from Mirat University, Mirat. His specialization is on plant physiology and biochemistry. His research interest on molecular physiology of abiotic phase. He was also interested on ecophysiology on high altitude medicinal plants. Now, I will inform the academic position held by Dr. Sharma. He was, not, he was the assistant professor in the Department of Botany, Nehu, Shilong. He was present a professor, Department of Bioscience, Himachal Pradesh University, Shimla. He was also a professor of Department of Botany, School of Life Science, Sikkim University. He has also worked on many international collaboration and awarded different fellowships. I can mention just like this, Mary Kuri postdoctoral fellowship by European Commission, INSA DFJ fellowship in 2004, 2012, and 2019 from University of Belfort, Germany, DST Overship Associateship 2007 from Germany, JSPS Invitation Fellowship 2009 from Japan. He has completed several research projects, including DST DAAD and DST JSPS. He has published more than 4300 papers in high impact factor journal. So, sir, we are eagerly waiting to hear you. So, please, Dr. Sharma. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mandal. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mandal, for your kind words. Uh, a small correction. So nobody can publish 4,300 papers. So citations. yeah, that is the citations actually. Citation. Wonderful. Like we were looking at it and we were thinking amazing amount of citations you have. Okay. No, this. Wonderful uh, papers, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You asked me to send some details, so I sent it. Thank okay. You. So thank you very much, and uh, it was a wonderful uh, talk by uh, Chatterjee Sir, uh, because uh, he has first-hand experience with so many cases, and it was very informative. I uh, I am educated with this. Thank you, thank you very much. 
Uh, you're welcome, sir. I have also been in uh, Shillong, so we have some common connection. So Dr. Vishwarupa Ghosh, so she was a student there. I taught there for some time. Okay, so I will be, actually, I do work uh, these days on uh, how plants, they do uh, tolerate uh, toxicants, particularly heavy metals, arsenic, and other things. So basic work we do carry out so that uh, we can get insight how, uh, how the organisms, they can handle the toxicants and that can, that can lead to some way out to find uh, solutions. But since the topic of uh, this uh, webinar is related to uh, conservation, biodiversity conservation, so I thought that I will share uh, some of our work that we carried out in Himachal Pradesh about high altitude medicinal plants. So I will be sharing with you uh, the role of uh, seed physiological aspects in conservation and cultivation of uh, medicinal plants. Can I please have my slides? What do I have to do? I have to share my screen yeah no we uh, yes I'll, I'll request the co-host okay um, so this is uh, dr shujish mira chakravarti could you kindly share uh, your slide it will be safer okay. that way no i'm uh, uh professor sharma would you like to share yourself or you want me to share your slide uh, how do you uh, what, think, what okay I'll, I'll share the slide for you then yes. and you can uh, you can give okay. the call that will be fine if that works better okay yes that, thank that you is all right. So you received this uh, uh, file that I yes, sent? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So here it is. Uh, can you see the uh, file? Uh, yes. So can I explain the... Full screen? The screen. Okay. I'll give, go to full screen mode. Uh, slideshow, can you... Uh, yeah. This see? I've done. Okay. Yes. I think it's uh, quite fine. So uh, while... And you... sir, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, when you want to change the slide, you just tell me next. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for this arrangement. I hope it will work well. So when I uh, prepared this, so I kept in mind the UG and PG students of your college. And uh, so it is seed physiological aspects of some medicinal plants from Western Himalaya and how uh, these aspects are important for cultivation and conservation of these plants. So next, please. Next slide. Uh, the last one. Okay, so we all understand the importance of plants. They are the primary producers and our dependence upon plants is complete for diverse purposes. So food, shelter, medicine, everything. And uh, so our country is, uh, has a very strong plant biodiversity. So about 45,000 plant species. Out of which 18,000 are flowering, flowering plants. So endemic species are close to 5,000. Now this endemism, so that is an indicator of uh, biodiversity richness of a country. So we do very well on this count. And more than 3000 species, so they do have documented uh, uh, advantage of uh, medicinal plants. Not only this, so the country has four biodiversity hotspots, as you know, the Western Ghats, the Himalayas, the Indo-Burma region, so that also includes some parts of Northeast India and Sundaland. So this includes the Nicobar group of islands. So biodiversity hotspots. So that tells about uh, the biodiversity richness of the country, different parts of the country. Next, please. So Indian Himalayan region. So this is very special. So this encompasses several states starting from Kashmir to Arunachal Pradesh. And uh, it's a hotspot of biodiversity. It has been a steady source of medicine for millions of people in the country and elsewhere. And the plants in Himalayas, they're used not only for food, fodder, fuel, timber, etc. They are important for medicine and they're important for various other purposes. Okay, so once again, so 8,000 species in IHR and medicinally important plant species are 1,748, out of which uh, the herbs dominate. So more than 1,000 herb species that are medicinal. So shrubs and trees, so 300 each plus. So they're also important. I will be taking you to this region, trans Himalayan region, Ladakh and Lahore and Spiti particularly in Himachal Pradesh. So uh, this, this area. So this has three, three, seven species of medicinal plants and strong endemism. So 62 endemic uh, plants in this region. So next ma'am. 
next please okay so himachal pradesh so it is uh, it has a very strong uh, background it has a very strong connection with ayurveda with medicinal plants and all is a rich repository of medicinal plants 3000 plant species and more than 300 they are medicinal plants and 40 plant products they are extracted from forest uh, produce in the state you will be interested in knowing that ayurveda the ancient science of medicine it is believed to have its origin in himachal pradesh so its development then uh, some great scholars of ayurveda so they have connection with himachal pradesh so punar vasu atreya so is believed to have lived in chandra bhaga river catchment in lahore and speedy so in lahore and speedy so there are two rivers chandra and bhaga so they are the lifeline of uh, this uh, uh, this is special part of uh, himachal pradesh then nagarjuna so you know that uh, he has been a scholar in medicinal chemistry so he worked in kangra district dwaramukhi particularly and he eventually shifted his uh, research activities to trilokinath once again in lahore and speedy so plants in uh, himachal pradesh they are used in ayurveda yunani siddha and homeopathy so it has a strong connection with uh, himachal pradesh has a strong connection with uh, medicinal plants yes ma'am next please next please am i audible am i audible yes yes yes, yes. so should um, i skip this slide uh, okay so uh, actually in recent years what has happened that there has been a resurgence of interest in medicinal herbs all over the globe so why because they do have lesser side effects they do have a better compatibility with the human metabolism and uh, they are cheaper than modern medicines and in some areas in some areas they are the only option they are the only option for uh, curing the diseases because uh, every part is not lucky to have uh, the modern medicine so because of this what has happened that there is a tremendous increase in demand for medicinal plants all over the globe so india is the second largest producer of medicinal plants and uh, products so this is an immense potential in the global market because of this reason so behind china so this is the second largest producer of medicinal plants next ma'am next please okay so this increasing demand where did it come from so this is basically coming from the connection from the wild and that is the problem because in the wild so they grow very slow and uh, when they are growing very slow so regeneration is very slow exploitation exceeds so you can imagine the consequences so exploitation rates they exceed the natural regeneration and uh, that has led to drastic loss of medicinal plant wealth in all parts of the country so collection of medicinal plants from the wild is by unskilled workers there are additional factors so habitat loss so landslides natural as well as anthropogenic so construction activities road winding and many different activities so they are responsible for uh, the loss of medicinal plant wealth in himachal pradesh because of this so many plants they have become threatened at different levels of threat so different levels of threat means that critically endangered medicinal plants that dwell in himachal pradesh critically endangered means that are towards uh, the extinction so 23 plant species they are endangered already and 31 so they are also vulnerable so if we do not take uh, measures uh, with the uh, appropriate interventions so we are going to lose them fast so next ma'am next slide please okay so what should be done so what's the need of the r need of the r is to develop conservation strategies and these conservation strategies so they have to be cost effective and they have to be realistic i think we cannot uh advice we cannot suggest anything so they have to be cost effective they have to be realistic so that so qualitative and quantitative restoration can take place of the uh, this so you understand that uh, we often talk about in situ conservation and ex situ conservation but in situ conservation this may be insufficient because this may not be sufficient to meet the increasing demand for medicinal herbs so what should be done so one way out is that that commercial cultivation should be encouraged so they should be uh, they should be encouraged and uh, 
what will happen what will happen due to this that pressure on the wild population so that will decrease that will decline so cultivation if we have to increase the cultivation then we have to think about that how the plants are propagated so all the students of botany so we all understand that there are three main means of plant propagation so we can propagate plants through seeds we can propagate plants through vegetative uh, propagules in some cases and uh, we can grow them in tissue culture so micro propagation so if we have to grow the plants in tissue culture then uh, certain infrastructure of laboratory is required so we can't recommend this uh, for uh, this uh, conservation purposes so out of these three means so which, which is the most effective and is the most realistic the seed based one because nature is provided us with seeds so we must examine the seeds that uh, how seeds they can be used for propagation of the medicinal plants and for cultivation and for conservation both the purposes so next sorry, sorry to interrupt you sir yes. sir excuse me excuse uh, me yes sir could you just move a little away from the system uh, there is a sound uh, interruption uh, can we check your voice if you move a little away from your system and speak so i should come close to the system no, no, a little away away from it is this okay yes sir this is okay thank you sir it, uh, is it better yes sir it's better there was some i think um, fixation problem it was shaking the voice was shaking this is better okay so i can once uh, helps it's fine it's sir continue okay. sir continue is it okay yes sir it's okay no because even i cannot uh, hear you properly okay no we can hear so earlier it was not so we can hear you properly kindly continue okay so initially it was not so no it was good in between there were few interruptions it's fine now no does it make sense is it okay am i audible absolutely audible sir please go on okay, okay thank you very much okay so if we have to use the seeds for uh, propagation of plants then in case of uh, the wild plants including the medicinal plants so there are two conditions which do hamper the propagation so one is the seed dominancy and second is erratic seed generation behavior so dominancy uh, you know that uh, yes sir Okay, Chetan Sir, are you saying something? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, you are muted, Doctor uh, Mr. Ranjan Chetan Sir. Uh, you are muted. Yeah, uh, Doctor Ghosh, even I cannot uh, hear you properly. There is some problem in. Professor Sharma. Uh, Professor Sharma, can you yeah. hear me? Professor Sharma. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, there is. Wait, yes. 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 Uh, you can hear me. Uh, okay. Yes, I can. But can oh, you hear? Oh, video. Me? Yeah, you please switch off your video, and then you. Uh... Okay. Uh, yes, Hello. I switched off my video. Yes, it is fine now. Okay. That right, it works better. Right. You can continue now. Okay, it works better. Yes, it is sounding better. Yes. Okay, so I'm sorry because uh, this uh, technology-based presentation, so we can have. this kind of yes. interruptions uh, sorry to interrupt okay so if we I have to like, i would just like to inform our viewers also sir is uh, streaming from sikkim where there are some reception problems so kindly bear with us and uh, sir kindly go on it's coming clear now okay so yes in fact i'm uh, i'm i'm in gangtok and it is uh, dark already outside raining and dark so okay so um, uh, actually so seed based propagation so this faces uh, uh, so two hindrances one seed dominancy so seeds are dominant and seeds they often exhibit erratic germination behavior so dominancy so we know that uh, seeds are viable but seeds they cannot germinate when they are subjected to favorable germination conditions so this state is known as seed dominancy okay and second is uh, erratic germination erratic germination means that seeds they do not Uh, germinate synchronously like in case of crop plants you see farmers uh, so we grow wheat we grow rice so what happens in the field all seeds they will germinate simultaneously synchronously so that they can grow simultaneously and they can be harvested simultaneously but in case of wild plants 
including medicinal plants, this doesn't happen. So seeds, they germinate in batches. So 20% seeds, they will germinate uh, this week. Another 20% seeds, they might germinate after two months. Now, these conditions, nature has devised them. Nature has devised them as survival strategies. Because you see, if seeds are not dormant, so in the mountains, most of the medicinal plants, so they are producing the fruits in September and October. So seeds, they become available in October. So if seeds, they will germinate in October, then young fragile seedlings, they can perish in the snow in December and January. They can't withstand uh, the strong uh, extreme temperature conditions. So nature has made them dormant so that they can pass uh, the harsh winters and seed germination will take place in spring. So seedlings, they will uh, be sturdier enough to withstand uh, the environmental uh, adversities and they can, they can survive. The same thing is with erratic seed germination. Because if all seeds germinate in the forest synchronously, then what will happen if some harsh circumstances they prevail, they do come, then all of them, they will perish. But if they are growing in batches, then what will happen? That if first batch does not survive, second batch will survive, second batch does not survive, so the third batch will survive. So survival can be ensured through these mechanisms. So from nature's perspective, so these uh, seed dominancy and erratic germination, so they are all right. But from cultivation point of view, so they are a hindrance, they are a disadvantage. We cannot ask a farmer to grow medicinal plants which will not uh, germinate, or if they germinate, they will not germinate synchronously. So what is required is that the dormancy has to be removed, germination has to be improved, and germination has to be such that all seeds, they germinate simultaneously. So that farmers, they can harvest the plants simultaneously. Okay, so students of botany, they know that uh, technically speaking, there are many different types of dormancy, uh, physiological dormancy, morphological dormancy, morphophysiological dormancy, physical dormancy, chemical dormancy, etc. So not going into details of them, so uh, we can talk about some uh, some simple terms. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hello. Yeah, I've shared, Hello. sir. Hello, I've shared, sir. I've just changed the slide. It will take some time for you. Okay. Am I am I audible? I'm not sure. You are perfectly audible, sir. Please continue. Okay. Okay. So thank you because uh, uh, one cannot make out how it is going actually. Okay. So the common reasons for uh, seed dormancy and uh, the common means of dormancy elevation. So seeds they can have hard coat, hard seed coat, and hard seed coat means they they cannot imbibe water or they cannot exchange gases for respiration, etc. Second very common reason is that the embryo remains immature and this needs some after ripening, after harvesting, so that this becomes mature and seeds they can germinate. Then many seeds, they do have chemical inhibitors. So chemical inhibitors of different categories. So these chemical inhibitors, they do not allow the seeds to germinate. So phenolic compounds and everybody understands the role of abscisic acid. So to the young students of UG and PG, uh, can you, uh, can you make out why uh, seeds, say for example, that they are present in a tomato fruit, why they do not germinate while they are within the fruits? Have you imagined this? Because this germination has to be stopped. They should not be allowed when they are present in uh, the fruits. And abscisic acid plays a very, very impo important role in this. Abscisic acid, so keeps them, uh, keeps the germination inhibited. So you know this uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, the model plant system. In Arabidopsis thaliana, so mutants they can be easily generated. And uh, so some mutants, they have been produced in Arabidopsis thaliana, which cannot synthesize abscisic acid. And uh, you will be surprised to know that in these mutants, viviparia occurs. Viviparia occurs means that seeds, they can germinate while they are still attached to the food. That is the silicon. You see, so this proves that abscisic acid is important for this. You also know from mangrove uh, plants. So in mangroves also, so viviparity occurs. So there is a lack of abscisic acid. So seeds, they have to be designed. So they have to be regulated in a need-based manner. So commonly applied 
physical chemical and hormonal interventions to remove dormancy so they are like this so one can treat the seeds with acid one can scarify them mechanically so if seed coat is hard then seed coat can be softened and then so what can be imbibed and germination will take place then seeds they can be simply subjected to low temperatures so chilling so this chilling is very very important in many medicinal plants and this chilling chilling promotes the synthesis of gibberellic acid in the seeds you know that gibberellic acid has a very important role in germination of the seeds then some other physical uh, chemical effectors are potassium nitrite simply azides so what do they do so there is one normal respiration for energy generation but when this is uh, this has to be supplemented then so uh, this uh, alternate respiration that can be switched on with this kind of treatments then seeds they can be subjected to hot and cold water leaching so what will happen that the chemical inhibitors they will come out of the seeds and uh, once the concentration of these inhibitors so that is reduced so what will happen that seeds they will they will germinate now in recent years so this is a very important effector nitric oxide so many of you must be familiar with this so sodium nitroprusside is used as a donor of nitric oxide is a signaling molecule it regulates many physiological processes including seed germination and in recent years it has been found to be effective in improvement of germination of many plants and of course so phytohormones they are important so gibberellic acid is most important but kinetin and even auxins they can be applied yes next slide please ma'am next slide please okay so we have uh, studied the seed germination behavior of many high altitude medicinal plant species of himachal pradesh so lahol and spiti and kinnor so two areas so today i'll be sharing with you information with the four or five examples so you can get an idea that how these effectors so they use in alleviation of dormancy and in improvement of uh, seed germination so, but before that i would introduce you to this special leader lahol and spiti so next slide please Uh, so here is uh, here is uh, himachal pradesh and in himachal pradesh so this is uh, the district of lahol and spiti so it is a part of cold desert zone of himachal pradesh so cold desert very low temperature and desert uh, scarcity of water so this is very very special you can see this is uh, borders with kashmir and uh, uh, china on the other side and so spiti is very harsh so to get here i must tell you because we have been going there for collection of the seeds so yes last no the last last slide please last slide please yes yes so to uh, get to lahol and spiti uh, i was in himachal pradesh in shimla so it used to take two days so from shimla we would go to manali on day one we would stay overnight in manali and next morning we'll go to uh, lahol lahol valley so to reach lahol valley so one has to cross uh, rotang pass so rotang pass altitude is 13300 feet and uh, for more than six months it is under snow so you can imagine that lahol is cut off from rest of the country for more than six months in a year so the students from the whole institute so they used to go home after six months because there is there was there was no way out then a very special feature about this area lahol and spiti is that there is a rain shadow rain shadow means that very little rain why those clouds they cannot cross rotan pass 13000 feet so they are they are they are hampered by rotan pass they cannot cross uh, rotan pass and therefore there is very little rain in lahol and spiti so very very little rain so it snows directly in in the winters then conditions are very harsh conditions are very harsh means that extreme temperatures so in some parts the temperature can be minus 30 and in some parts during summers temperature can be plus 30 so that is the range of temperature in this so soil fertility is very low and under these circumstances so plants are growing so some medicinal plants are growing and uh, you know so the medicinal plants which are growing in these areas 
they are endowed with very special secondary metabolites they do produce very special secondary metabolites because of the harsh conditions in response to the adverse circumstances in which they are growing so they do produce this kind of uh, substances you see uh, all uh, all students of botany they can make out that normally what happens that if everything is available in plenty to the plants so what will plants do plants will photosynthesize plants will photosynthesize means that they will gain carbon and so from the soil so they will take other nutrients nitrogen phosphorus etc and they will synthesize whatever they like to do but under harsh circumstances i am giving you just one example say for example there is no nitrogen in the soil there is no nitrogen in the soil but there is sufficient light so what will happen that plants they will photosynthesize they will photosynthesize means that there will be carbon gain but soil is deficient in nitrogen there is no nitrogen so without without nitrogen what will they do with carbon without nitrogen they cannot produce proteins they cannot produce nucleic acids they cannot produce many nitrogenous substances which are very important but yet they have surplus carbon so under such circumstances they will produce the molecules which need carbon and not nitrogen i will give you one example you know anthocyanins anthocyanins are pigments anthocyanins are pigments and anthocyanins they do have carbon hydrogen and oxygen in their structure they do not have nitrogen in their structure so under these harsh circumstances when they do have carbon but they do not have nitrogen for example so hypothetically so they will synthesize anthocyanins so in the same manner so they they do synthesize many many metabolites so my young friends in your college so they would understand that why do we call them secondary metabolites they are not secondary in importance we have to always remember whenever we mention the term secondary metabolites we have to remember that they are never secondary in they are never secondary in importance they are secondary only in synthesis because secondary metabolites are synthesized first okay i have a message that uh, voice is not clear hello yes sir uh, it's partly hello. some mostly it is clear sometimes it's not clear okay so what can i do internal uh, microphone we continue sir let's see continue uh we'll stop slide sharing after some time host could you talk to sir yeah hello hello, hello sir can you hear hello. me yeah can you hear me uh not clearly not clearly actually okay uh i think uh, a little while ago i can you shift a little backwards i think then your voice comes clear yeah can you speak uh no it's better yeah hello hello it's better of course it's better your voice is breaking yeah hello uh, yeah it is right it is okay now it's all right now Is it okay? Yeah, it is okay. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm very sorry. Actually, no I issues, sir. No issues. Kindly continue. In case we see further there are issues, then we will stop slideshow and you can continue, sir. Is that okay, okay. sir? Okay. So I will, I will call. I will call somebody. I think the speaker. Just a moment. it could be a reception problem sir it may not be a hardware problem hello does it work it works and are you a little away from the one i mean a few fingers away from the system uh no is it is it so right from the beginning or it worsened no no not not from the beginning sir in between in okay. between at the same place Okay, sir. Just uh, stay saying. a little away from the system. It, I think, it will be better. I There's a little a, away. Yes, there is echoing effect, so a little away from the system will help us. It's okay, sir. Yes, sir. Continue, sir. We will let you know in case we need to stop slideshow. We'll let you know. No, because again, I cannot, uh, I cannot hear you clearly. Yes, there is reception problem. Yes, there is. Some Continue, problem. sir. Continue, sir. Okay, so I was uh, yes, I was uh, I was talking about the secondary metabolites because under these harsh conditions, so plants they do uh, produce these special chemicals, special molecules, secondary metabolites. 
And we have to keep in mind that secondary metabolites, they're secondary in synthesis. They are never secondary in importance. Okay, so I get the message that it is much clear. Okay, so uh, students, they have to remember that they are secondary only in uh, synthesis, not in importance. Can you imagine chlorophyll is a secondary metabolite? Had it been so, so chlorophyll would have been uh, useless. So when we, when we say secondary to some entity, so it looks uh, somewhat derivative. Okay, so on this space, keep remember, please remember that secondary metabolites like chlorophylls, like all things, they are all secondary metabolites. And uh, these secondary metabolites, they do have strong antioxidant properties. And because of these special properties, so medicinal uh, properties, they do come. Uh, in fact, our food also is that, that brighter, the better. So brighter food is better. Why? Because brighter means that uh, it will have other pigments, endocyanins, beta-cyanins, carotenes, and all of them are uh, antioxidants. Yes, next, please. Next, please. Okay, so this is exactly the area, part and valley, so where we worked on these plants. So next, please. Next. Next, please. Yes, next slide, please. Okay, so we have some glimpses of uh, part and valley. So, and uh, so we worked on uh, 20, more than 25 plant species. So what do we do? We study viability status, germination behavior, dormancy status, elimination of dormancy by various physicochemical hormonal treatments. We detect chemical inhibitors, and we do carry out some metabolic studies to examine so why they are dormant and what can be done. Next, please. Next. OK, so I'll give you some examples. So this plant is very special, photo, film, etc. I hope many of you have heard about it, Dr. Ghosh particularly. So it's a member of Barbidesi. Common English name is Himalayan Nea. In Hindi, this is known as Ban Kapi. And it's an endangered plant. People of uh, many reasons. So perennial herb. It is found in the elevations up to 4,000. And why is this important? So this is important because this produces. So last, last slide is on. Okay. This is important for the process of photo Professor Sharma. Sharma. Sorry to interrupt you. Yes. But your voice is breaking. Your voice is breaking. Yes. We can't hear you properly. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. 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 It's all right. Sir, I think whenever you are coming closer to the system, it might be an issue. We don't know, okay. but we are just trying to solve it. When you are coming closer to the system, there is an echoing and there are some uh, interruptions. So if you spoke a little away from okay. the system, so, let's let's try and see if that works. Is it okay? Is it okay? So, is it okay from this position? It sounds okay, sir. It sounds okay. Shall I go back? No, uh, uh, it's perfectly. Yeah, you can continue from the active principles. Okay, so in fact, uh, your voice is also not clear. So there is something wrong with. Okay, uh, so this produces podophyllotoxin. Podophyllotoxin is a precursor for etococyte. And uh, that is an effective agent in treatment of lung cancer. So this plant is basically anti-cancerous. So roots and vegetables. They can also be used for other purposes. Okay, so germination status is very poor. Uh, hello, so I have removed the headset. Uh, I, I think it's better. Yes, yes, you have removed the headset. Now it is sounding properly. So please continue, sir. The sound is clear. I'm getting a message. Your sound is clear now. Uh, please continue. Uh, can you okay, can you so hear? I demute it once and then I try it again. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, Dr. Uh, Ghosh, uh, but your voice is also breaking now. Yes, sir. We can hear Hello. you, sir. 
Hello, we can hear you, sir. Please continue. You have a connectivity uh, issue. It is better. Yeah. Better. Better. We can hear you, sir. Getting the message from the uh, could you please log out and log in again? Uh, what should I do? Uh, you just log out and then log in again. Log in again? Yes. I log out and I leave and log in again? Yeah. Yes, yes. But now you are sounding perfectly all right. I think. I uh, I log in. So uh, you are sounding perfectly. Now we can hear you clearly. Okay, so this is surprising. I'm no, I'm in the same is, position. Yeah, I know. It is because your connectivity is not stable. That's why sometimes your voice is drifting off, and sometimes yes. it is yes. clear. That that could yes. be the reason. Yes, I can see that from here, your connectivity is not stable all the time. When it is stable, we can hear okay, you properly. So I'm, uh, yes. Yes, I'm terribly sorry but, for this. No, but, no, it's uh, it's all I, right, sir. But most of the thing we are hearing it, it's it's perfectly all right. So please continue. So because this is beyond my beyond my control. <laughs> okay. So is the voice clear now? Absolutely, sir. Okay. So uh, this plant is known for podophyllotoxin, that is anti-cancerous plant. But this is this is poor germination because of the seed dormancy. Okay, thank you, thank you, Shikha. So she said that I am audible now. Yes, next slide, please. So this is the control, and here it is gibberellic uh, acid. Now, a very important issue about. Uh, the seeds is that that how long the seeds they can be viable, and this is known as longevity. So, what is the longevity of the seeds? Because the seeds they have to be used, so they should remain viable for a long period of time. I hope the students they know that some seeds they are viable only for a few weeks. In your neighborhood, you must have seen mango, Azadiata indica, that is neem, Shoria robusta. So these are some examples where seeds, they do not remain viable for a very long time. So they remain viable for a couple of months only. And after that, they lose viability. What is the reason? The reason is that, that they cannot reduce their moisture contents below a certain level. And these seeds, they are known as recalcitrant seeds. Recalcitrant seeds. But normal seeds, they are known as orthodox seeds. Orthodox seeds, all crop plants, so wheat, etc. So most of the seeds they are orthodox. And orthodox seeds, they can reduce their moisture contents to as low as 5%. And that is how they can remain. It is not working. I'm sorry. Yeah, phone se baat kar sakte hai kya? Sir, you're absolutely uh, audible. No yeah. issues, sir. So kindly uh, don't uh, follow the chat now. Kindly don't follow the chat now. Thank you, uh, sir. We'll manage that later. Okay. No, but so, I'm getting the message that uh, uh, it will Professor be Sharma, over to Professor uh, Sharma, can I interrupt? Uh, it is because yes. the participants' connectivity is also poor. That's why maybe he or she is not hearing it properly. But we at okay. here are able to hear you perfectly. So you can so, continue, but, uh, sir. What yeah, you 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 know the chat right now. Uh, I, we can handle the issues. So please continue, sir. We we are hearing okay, you clearly. Okay, so somebody Anita Anita Chakraborty. So she is saying you are very audible, sir. Yeah, no, Anita's connectivity is poor. She is uh, most of the times uh, logging in and logging out. So, sir, continue, please. You can continue. It's perfectly all right. You are audible, sir. Okay, so I was uh, I was talking about. Okay, so <laughs> I get uh, I'm getting the message from the germination can be improved with gibberellic acid, and also by simply chilling. So chilling is also very effective. You see, control 
but substantial improvement with chilling of the seeds. And uh, storage studies, they do show that seeds, they lose viability gradually. So after one year, uh, after one year, this is okay, but gradually this starts going down. So something has to be done about this. Because if seeds, they have to be used. So that longevity has to be enhanced. So as a principle, so I know West Bengal is a producer of potato. So a lot of potato is produced. And how do we, how do we store potato? We store potato in cold stores. Why? Because in cold stores, what will happen? So potato is basically starch. So if we keep potato at under ambient conditions, ambient conditions means at normal room temperature. So what will happen? Enzymes like amylases, they will be slowly acting on the starch. And after a while, you must have experienced that potato starts uh, becoming sweet. Why? Because starch is converted to sugars. Okay, so if we want to enhance the life of potato, so what do we do? We keep it at low temperature in cold stores. Okay, so the same uh, logic applies to the seeds also. Because seeds, they do have food results. It does have embryo. So food results, they should not be hydrolyzed very quickly. So if they are hydrolyzed quickly, so seeds, they will lose their viability. So for the storage, uh, the same principle applies, that low temperature and low relative humidity. So they are required for this. And ex situ conservation, so many of you would know, particularly Dr. Vishnu Paghosh, that there are mechanisms for this. So uh, low temperature, very low temperature, liquid nitrogen, etc. So seeds are important and seed viability that has to be, uh, you see, that has to be enhanced. Yes, next, please. Next. Okay, so here it is the same thing that we studied these seeds for up to five years, 66 months. And every month we were uh, uh, doing this uh, germinability. And this goes down gradually, and, but this can be enhanced with some interventions. So interventions are required. And what I'm presenting is our own work that is published, Journal of Applied Research on Medicinal and Aromatic Plants. Okay, so next, next please. Okay, so this is under the lab conditions, under different treatments. So they germinate and they can be taken to the pots so they do survive. And so these interventions, they do help. Next, please. Okay, so here is a very important plant, Arnibia euchroma, family Goradinesi. So common name is Ratanjot. You must, uh, some of you must be knowing about this. And in Spiti Valley, so this plant is, uh, from Spiti, and uh, this was collected by a student <clears throat> from an altitude of 4,200 meters. You see, so its distribution is very limited. So it is found in dry areas of Alpine, West Himalaya, West Tibet, and Nepal. And uh, so, as far as the status is concerned, this is endangered. Okay, so population is diminishing, dwindling. Uh, so roots they are used for various purposes anti-tumor, anti-HIV activities, anti-inflammatory activities, anti-microbial activities. Uh, so common problems of cough, lung problems, and uh, here dandruff also, this is used for that. And very importantly, you must have uh, uh, heard about Ratanjo. So this is used for coloring the food preparations by the inhabitants of Lahore and Spiti. This is a poor germination. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. So here, so what we find that in control, so germination is very low, you see, so this is, this is the germination percent. But this can be improved surprisingly by uh, proline, by proline and by gibralic acid. So gibralic acid, we know very well that this promotes C germination, but this is very interesting that proline can also promote C germination. I hope uh, many of you know about uh, proline. So proline is a special amino acid. As far as the structure is concerned, it is an amino acid. This has an extraordinary solubility in water. So you can make 12 molar solution of uh, proline, which is not the case with other amino acids. And proline is very important in providing uh, tolerance, adaptation to many different abiotic stresses, particularly water deficit, and uh, salinity and even uh, uh, toxic metals. So proline is important. So basically this is osmoprotectant, number one. And number two, this is also antioxidative. 
So this can scavenge free radicals. So because of these two properties, this might have uh, promoted desamination. But this is very important here that protein can also be used for uh, promotion of cisamination in addition to germinic acid. And similarly, so what is important here is that that SNP, SNP is sodium nitroprusite. So sodium nitroprusite is a chemical which donates, so which produces nitric oxide. As I uh, told you earlier, that nit nitric oxide is a signaling molecule. Signaling molecule means that this can trigger the events which are responsible for many different physiological processes, including C germination. So with SNP also, you see, so C germination is promoted. So SNP and proline, so they can also be used. So there is a wide range of chemicals, wide range of effectors, which can be used to alleviate dormancy and to improve C germination. And there is a need to uh, test. So these kind, kind of effectors with a whole range of medicinal plants and uh, common plants. Yes, next, next please. Okay, so this is also very important as far as the Lahore region is concerned. Inula racemosa, family Asteraceae. So you must have heard this name in Hindi, Pushkar Moon. So it is basically Pushkar Moon. But uh, population status, this is critically endangered. Roots and seeds, they are used for medical purposes. So this is critically endangered. And actually this is grown as a cash crop in Lahore. So anti-helminthic, antiseptic, anti-inflammatory, and seeds are aphrodisiac. So status, seeds are dormant. But this dormant seed can be simply removed by chilling. So you don't need any expensive chemicals. And the acid, of course, and type of dormancy is physiological dormancy. Next, next please. Next. Okay, so this is the, uh, no, the last one. Okay, so this is the crop of uh, Pushkar Moon. This is being cultivated in Lahore. So snow covered during winter months and after winter, so this grows faster. Next, next please. please. Okay, I think I have to uh, thank you. I'm uh, very sorry for the interruptions, but this was beyond my control. I could not, uh, I could not help it. So uh, I hope you would visit Sikkim in the near future when the pandemic allows, when the situ uh, norm situation normalizes. So you're welcome to uh, Sikkim and to the Department of Botany. So thank you very much. I'm not sure how much this could be conveyed because of the voice uh, break. Thank you so much, sir. I, I think we have had 95% of your presentation was very audible. How much? 95% was very audible. Okay. Yes, Thank you so much. Okay. I, I just want to thank you and tell you that uh, you were reluctant to talk about your work, but we wanted you because we thought we want to introduce to our participants the seed as a capsule of the genetic capsule of the plants, how important it is to know the ecology of each seed in the whole scheme of biodiversity conservation. Sir has talked about Sotoria and all other plants, medicinally important, endemic, also having germination issues, largely in the trade market. So it is very important to know, uh, uh, have a great scientific uh, background of these plants, the germination ecology, so that we can uh, devise wisely their conservation aspects. We can approach the conservation with a sound scientific background. Thank you for your wonderful deliberation, sir. I would request Dr. Shuchishmita Chakravarti, our co-host, to kindly take up the interaction session. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vishwarupa. I must thank you and I must thank uh, the organizers, principal ma'am, and all other colleagues that you invited me to share our work on uh, medicinal plants. Thank you so much. Institutes. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vishwarupa uh, Ghosh. Uh, and sir, there are a few questions, both from YouTube as well as uh, those watching here at Zoom. So okay. I'll take up a question from YouTube first. Uh, this is from Farhan Ahmed. He asks, sir, why we have selected one millimolar concentration of GA3? Would higher concentration be better uh, for seed longevity? Uh, 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 Farhan, thank you for this question. 
So actually, uh, before selecting the concentrations of any effector in uh, physiology or in biochemistry or in molecular biology, so we do carry out some uh, some prelim preliminary experiments. So where, where we do find that which concentrations they are effective and which are not. And uh, so we try to keep on the lower side. If we are achieving 80% diminution with one millimolar, that is good enough. Millimolar, that is millimolar. So for some physiological processes, so this can be micromolar. Actually, what happens is that, that different substances, they do have different range of physiological concentrations. Okay, so hormones, they are effective in low concentrations. But say, for example, if you are applying proline, so proline doesn't work the way hormones work. So it is required because this is an osmo regulator. So what will happen? So proline will have to be taken in high concentrations. So it depends upon the function of a molecule. It depends upon uh, the mechanism of action of the molecule on which uh, the concentration choice that depends. So hormones, they are usually uh, effective in very low concentrations. So Thank we you, sir. on the basis of some preliminary experiments. And Thank you, sir. Uh, yes. I hope uh, your answer, your question has been answered, uh, Farhan. And the next question is uh, from Samrat Banerjee. He says, mm -hmm. thank you, madam. Can we overcome the seed dormancy by in vitro propagation method? Yes. Yes, we can do. I, I, I said that micro propagation is a way to propagate uh, the plants, but uh, that will require some infrastructure. So you need a tissue culture lab, et cetera. So seed-based uh, seed based elevation, so this is much cheaper, much uh, convenient, much, but of course, scientifically, this can be done in vitro. So micropropagation has been exercised. This has been practiced for many, many, many plant species. That is the standard way of uh, propagating the plants, which otherwise are difficult to grow. That is right. Okay, uh, the next question is from uh, Suparna Bhattacharji. Okay. Uh, does carbon nanotubes used in in vitro propagation acts as antifungal agent okay. in foliage plants? Uh, I think this is not related with this work, but this carbon nanotubes actually, uh, so I have, uh, I, have, I have a little familiarity about this, but I think this is not uh, related with this carbon nanotubes and fungi, uh, but how can this be? Uh, maybe they can be used. To, uh, I, I have no idea whether they have been tested for seed germination studies. But maybe that's a good idea if uh, that is effective for fungus, so somebody can try them for uh, seed physiological functions also. Uh all right sir uh, thank you so much there have been uh, a lot of messages both at the youtube and here also thanking you uh, for your wonderful presentation and very informative and interesting one and uh, especially some of them have uh, appreciated those uh, pictures of uh, i mean uh, the orchids and all those wonderful places at uh, sikkim and okay. we yeah. hope yeah, yes, we hope that uh, we will one day take our students to your place and you'll give a good, yes, yes, and so because, uh, yes, thank you, yes, thank you, sir, thank you, sir, for being here with us, uh, and hello, I'll... hello, Shuchishmita, yes. uh, there's another question from Shomrat Banerjee, please take yes. up the question, yes. uh, uh, yes, this is, a, sorry, uh, there was one question at the very beginning of the uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, this is a, a little general question, uh, yes. but I'll, I'll surely take up this question. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dr. Gongopadhyay, for reminding me. Okay. Uh, it is from Sh Samrat Banerjee. Uh, he asked, my question is, can we omit the collection and submission part in our syllabus of botany to conserve biodiversity. Oh, yes, I think this is very often talked about. This is very often talked about. So we all have to, I think this is a, uh, thank you for his uh, very kind concern. And in fact, all academics, they are concerned with this these days. There is a lot of awareness. And whenever in the field, I think we should keep this in mind, actually. We, just, we should keep this in mind. 
so we should have an idea about the distribution of the plants about their uh, available populations and we should not damage them so that's a, that, that is very very clear i think there is no there is no true opinions about it so plants are precious and uh, some of them they are already uh, they have suffered a lot so we cannot afford to uh, play around uh, just like just like that they go and collect and bring them home and throw do nothing so that is and they are very slow growing some of them they grow very slow ye this is not potato this is not wheat that you are irrigating you are providing fertilizers they are growing in harsh environments of uh, himalayas minus 30 degrees celsius they have to spend a couple of months and then they do come up after afterwards so you you think about their life cycle about how they are surviving so nature has been kind so nature has provided survival strategies and out of these survival strategies they do produce unique chemicals okay so if the same plant is brought to say punjab or chandigarh or haryana this will this number one this will not grow but if you make it grow this will not produce the same chemicals because this is not uh, it is basically responding to uh, the surroundings responding to the adversities thank you dr shuchishmita chakravarti for taking up the interaction and the last question has also opened up a scope for us to spread a message to all our faculty participants uh, including ourselves that uh, when we take our students for field excursion we need a sound knowledge of the phytogeography of the area the endemic uh, status and threatened status of the species maybe we could go for uh, photographs more of photographs and one or two collections for yes. our herbarium by I the way that, that should be allowed for the students so by the way i would like to add that in sikkim uh, the regulations are very stringent so we are not allowed to even if uh, in an msc student has to work for dissertation so he or she has to seek permission from forest department so without the permission they cannot go to the forest and collect the plants if i apply for a project so i have to seek permission from the uh, authorities in sikkim government uh, to work on these plants for example i'm i started work on some land races of rice so i have applied to the government for uh, this uh, permission and i'm still waiting for the response so uh, this kind of regulations so uh, they need to be in place they need to uh, so that the way out actually best best is that uh, from our side so we educate ourselves about them and we behave uh, in such a manner that uh, we do not harm these populations rare populations thank you I, so much sir somebody, somebody was asking about books yes please could you uh, so, just uh, my on. advice my advice to the students will be that please read reading is very very important reading besides information and knowledge reading gives us vocabulary we need vocabulary to communicate whether verbal communication or written communication in research all of you will appreciate that communication is very very important so please read some good books and these days there are lots of good books lots of good books so for, for example in plant physiology so my colleagues i can Uh, tell this bushanan so bushanan is the best book so we have the second edition 2015 etc so ye uh, is a very good thing that you are concerned about uh, the books they are available in e uh, resources are available in many many libraries these days thank you so much sir that was really a wonderful interaction and i think very useful and some very key issues of uh, students of biological science have come up and so happy to see their concern about biodiversity conservation uh, we wish you uh, good luck in life and i would like to uh, end our technical sessions and go over to our next uh, program uh, i invite my colleague dr priyanku dhar to kindly uh, deliver the vote of thanks to the speakers and the audience So first of all I thank everybody principal ma'am all faculty members all participants for sparing their time uh, to listen to me thank you so much thank you sir dr priyanku dhar are you online uh -huh. post dr priyanku dhar are you online uh -huh.
Hello, uh, yes, Dr. Ghosh. I'm online. Can you hear me? Yes, you're audible. Uh, we are starting with the vote of thanks session. Uh, I ask you to kindly deliver a vote of thanks. Yes, thank you, Dr. Ghosh, for providing me the opportunity. Good evening to all of you. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. On behalf of the organizing committee, I express deep gratitude to the first keynote speaker, Sri Ranjan Chatterjee, for sharing his vast experience and delivering an excellent talk on environmental issues and role of the National Green Tribunal in our country. His talk has opened our eyes to various environmental damages caused by anthropogenic, anthropogenic activities and its remediation by the National Green Tribunal. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for the second keynote speaker, Professor Shanti Sharup Sharma, for sharing his findings and opinion on the seed physiological aspects of valuable medicinal plants from the Western Himalayan high altitude and implication for cultivation and conservation. On a personal note, I convey hearty thanks to Professor Sharma for allowing me to cherish my sweet memories of doing research on the health promoting properties of trans Himalayan medicinal plants of Ladakh like Sibakthon, apricot, etc. We are extremely delighted and indebted to hear from both of you, sir. I hope your deliberations and encouraging words will inspire us to take the new initiative in these areas. I convey special thanks to the students, faculty members, and all other participants who have shown their interest and actively participated in this webinar to make it successful. Our honorable principal ma'am, Professor Papia Chakraborty has provided us constant support. She is a great source of inspiration and encouragement for all of us. Thank you so much, ma'am. Once again, I want to state that we are all most grateful to all speakers on this virtual platform today. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Dhar. A wonderful uh, and very uh, warm vote of thanks to the, our speakers and our participants and our principal ma'am for uh, making this happen, this webinar series, uh, because we have a long journey to go. We are covering as many areas as possible in biodiversity conservation. And eventually we hope to reach uh, some uh, windows that would open up to find answers to various questions. The pandemic has opened this window for us to question ourselves, reassess our actions and revisit our role in biodiversity conservation. And uh, we have our next session, uh, our next day of this series on 29th of uh, August, same time. We'll have speakers uh, from uh, Florida Museum, uh, Dr. Narayani Bharve. She'll be speaking on ecological niche modeling. We'll be having a speaker from the Transdisciplinary University of uh, Bangalore, Health Sciences and Technology, Dr. Devabrutu Shaha will be speaking on the role of IUCN in biodiversity conservation. And I'm sure many of you will be finding career options also in all these webinar series. I'm sure our student participants will see a gateway opening for them uh, for a career in uh, biological sciences or social sciences or other sciences. That is our motto to keep going with the cause of biodiversity conservation and sustainable development. And we are so humbled and so grateful for the presence of such illustrious speakers who have given their lifetime in the area of biodiversity conservation in their own capacity. So thank you one and all. I hand over to our co-host, uh, Dr. Shuchishmita Chakraborty to sign off and give some uh, knowledge about the feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, I first thank all the participants and, and thank you, Professor Sharma and also the, uh, Mr. Chatterjee uh, for agreeing to come here and uh, deliver the lecture. It was very interesting. And I think we have come to the end of the program. And so I close this, uh, formally I close this meeting here. Thank you all. Thank you, participants. Thank you all. Thank you.